So, lessons from Calvin Ball. Creativity is good. What's that? Creativity is good? Yep. How did it feel to... It is good to confuse people. That's a lot of fun. How did it feel to create? Yes. Hard. Hard or fun? Probably. One or those two. Maybe both. Kind of depends on the person, I feel like. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it can be. It can be it could create, the game just kind of keeps changing. Everybody's creativity brings a little bit of joy or frustration to the game, for sure. How did it feel to have to respond to what somebody else did? That's why I got rid of all the rules. Ah! <laughs> kind of nice to clean the slate, right? It's good. Okay, fun. Well, uh, we're just, again, we're just, that's a fun little tactical to, um, tangible to tie it all together. So, uh, Star Wars fans, any Star Wars fans here? Okay, what is the story of Star Wars? Who's got it? What's the whole thing? What's, what's, the, what's, what's the, what is the story of Star Wars? Ah, interesting. Let's talk about it. What's the story? The galaxy is far, far away. There was a horse that keeps everything balanced. That's good. And there was a war between robots and man. There's a great well, teacher named Yoda. And then, yeah. every, and then the Emperor turned on, and then they were all killed. And then there were like two left, and then they destroyed the Empire. Good. Uh, I like that. OK. Again, good summary. Yeah, Daniel. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, 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 oh. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, and Spider-Man too. That's pretty much every. No. He probably did at some point in his own backwards way. All right. So, so I think we all have a sense of Star Wars, even if you aren't a fan of the movies. Um, if I were to tell you that the whole message of Star Wars is this one line, may the force be with you. It, it is and it isn't. I mean, there's way more to the story than this, but this is, this is a line in the story, okay? Uh, Napoleon Dynamite fans. Anybody here fans of Napoleon Dynamite? Okay. What is the story of Napoleon Dynamite? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> That's true. Just a lot of lines, not a lot of story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love the last montage. The scene is, is really good. Um, if some of you were to argue that the whole point of Napoleon Dynamite is this guy, you think anybody wants a roundhouse kick to the face while we're in these bad boys? Like, if this was the line that defined Napoleon Dynamite, arguably it does, because that's pretty much what every part of the movie is. But, like, it's more than this one line. It really is. Uh, and again, one of my favorite movies here, The Princess Bride. Uh, if you've not seen it, I don't want to spoil it for you. But I will tell you that a line that a lot of people quote from the movie, <laughs> inconceivable, yeah. is not the point of the story, even though it encapsulates the story, a part of it, in some way. All right. So Calvin Ball encapsulated what you came up with. There was a line that you came up with. There was an idea you came up with. And it was part of the game, but it wasn't the whole game. Same thing with what we read in Genesis. Everything we read in Genesis is a part of who God is. But it's way more, God is way more than all of that. And likewise, if we think we tame it by knowing a piece of it, we neglect the beauty of the rest of the story. So the question is, is why not look for the larger story and everything that we're reading, everything we're studying here today? Do you believe that you are important to God and so much more? Hopefully you do. Hopefully you see that in the scriptures and, and all of this that we've read, all of this that we've done today, is meant to personalize takeaways for you. Again, if you want to memorize, if you want to do all the academic stuff, if you want to be able to use science and prove it all, there's definitely a purpose for that. But if you do it at the expense of being loved by God and being transformed by God, you're missing why God did it in the first place. He definitely wows us with creation, but the purpose wasn't to wow us. The purpose was to woo us. Not just to wow us, but to woo us. And there's a big difference between that. Um, creation is part of your heritage from him. It is a heritage that God gives you. So it raises the question, what had to exist for all of this to exist? God. God had to exist. Specifically, we're going to call this the Trinity moment. Before there was anything, there was a community of someone. Just let that sink in for a second. Before there was anything, there was a community of someone. 
It tells us that in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is a plural word that is also singular. When it describes God, it is plural intensive, which means like we want to we want to give you as much weight as we can to this word to show that it is more than one, but it is absolutely one. So Elohim in the very first verse of the Bible is the Trinity. Some people may come to your door someday. They've come to mine and they will knock and they'll say, hi, we'd like to give you some literature on our on our religion. And, uh, and you'll say, well, tell me more and have conversations. And at some point you can ask a question like, well, do you believe in the Trinity? And they might say something back to you like, well, no, the Trinity, I dare you to show me where the Trinity exists in the Bible. The word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. You're like, well, it absolutely does. In the beginning, Elohim, Trinity. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This does not translate specifically to Trinity, but it is a plural, plural intensive, singular meaning word. Um, you can also quote John 1.1, 1, 1, like I said earlier. In the beginning uh, was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Pantheos, pantheon, those two words right there. Sometimes it helps to know a little bit of the, of the language, not to... Not to be smug, but to, to create, connect dots. Um, so, again, this is what the scriptures teach us, which means that natural laws don't inherently apply to the supernatural. For all of the natural things that we understand, something, someone had to exist that is not bound by those rules to create them, if you're tracking. So when we just went outside and we played Calvin Ball, all right, and again, for those of you who are like, I still don't know what Calvin Ball exactly is. So this is how it works. It's Saturday. What do you want to do? Anything but play an organized sport. Want to play Calvin Ball? Yeah. No sport is less organized than Calvin Ball. New rule, new rule. If you don't touch the 30-yard base wicket with the flag, you have to hop on one foot. So that's Calvin Ball. Um, the only permanent rule in Calvin Ball is that you can't play it the same way twice. The score is still Q to 12. So that's kind of the spirit of it. So when we understand the Trinity, when we understand that God is in some ways revealing himself to us through natural means. Again, before there was anything, there was a community of someone, which we were like, how does that even work? We can't understand it. Natural laws don't inherently apply to the supernatural. So just a quick little Trinity 101. I know some of you have heard lots and lots of different examples of the Trinity. I, these may be familiar to you. Um, I'm a big fan of cherry pie as, as an analogy here. Hot cherry pie. Anybody ever, ha like, cut into a hot cherry pie before? Like not just a cherry pie that's cold in the fridge, but like when it's hot and all the insides are oozing. And like imagine cutting that pie into three equal slices. And as soon as you pull the knife up, what happens on the inside? Yeah, it just it oozes right back into itself. So if you, don't, if you don't pull the pie piece out, you just cut the pieces. It is one pie, but it's in three sections, right? And hot underneath, it's still one pie, even though it's cut into three sections. So we see here that the Father is not the Spirit, is not the Son, but is God, is God, is God. So um, we're not going to necessarily look all these up, but if you want to capture this for later, these are great examples of how God says, hey, I am who I am. I have always existed. And I, I truly am the, um, uh, the present God. Like, I like that God's name isn't I was or I will be. It is I am. He doesn't want you to live in your past. He doesn't want you to like, be worried about the future. He wants you to receive him as God today, as the great I am. It says in Isaiah 64, 8, great verse again, uh, that God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. By the way, circle right there. How did we know that that was a circle? Why does, why does the word there also mean sphere? Before anybody discovered that the world was round, it says in Isaiah 64, 8, that he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, the sphere of the earth, and we are like grasshoppers before him. Uh, again, these other verses here, 1 John 5, 20, John 14, 16, 17, these are all great verses that point to the fact that God is singular and also plural at the same time, not in a pagan sense, but in a divine sense. Uh, another opportunity I like to look at is a fan. If you look at a fan when it's off, you see three blades, but when it's in motion, you see one. And so in some respects, we have clues to the Trinity around us all the time. When God is in motion, we can't tell who the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are as they're overlapping, but they do, and they absolutely uh, bless us in many ways. When, uh, uh, before, uh, I have three kids. Uh, before my daughter came along, it was just my wife and I and our boys, and we used to do all the you know, family stuff, played dodgeball or you know, kickball out in the cul-de-sac, and we did a Disney trip with, without my daughter. She wasn't born yet, and we just do stuff. It was a lot of fun. When each of my kids were born, uh, they got to be blessed by a nursery that we created for them. And so, you know, for, this is my son Daniel's when he was born, you know, like 
we thought, let's do this and let's spend time on it. And like, I don't know if you've talked to your parents about this kind of stuff, but you get a lot of joy shopping for your kids before they're born. Like, like you just get super giddy and you're like, let's get this matching wallpaper with a matching blanket and a matching this. And I'm like, it's just, this is a lot of fun. And let's buy this thing that sounds like a really good idea. It lights up, it'll keep them occupied, not thinking that's going to drive me crazy and give me a headache on day four. But it's fine. It is what it is. And so with each of my kids, we just spent time investing into it. And so when we learned that we were going to have a little girl we were like oh this would be fun now we get to buy pink stuff and that's exactly what we did and my wife loved it we went to a store called babies r us is but what but it's cool is you get to park in this parking spot we were like we get to park in the stork parking spot because my wife's pregnant i get to take her in anyway so we were really excited but then like as a family we pitched in and we turned what was once a blue room into a pink room and the boys got in on it and they got shirts and it was so much fun and we did this, guys, because even before we saw her face, we wanted it to be special. So when she arrived, it was our gift to her. And that's what happened. She came, and we loved her. We invited her into the family, and now there were five of us. And we even, you know, you got to get the sticker on the van. It's only official until you get the sticker on the van, I guess. And it was just, it was so good. It was so good. In fact, I remember I was watching her um, in her little, like, uh, uh, chair. Let me see if I get right here. I was watching her chair one day, and they and say yes for the dress was on in the background. I wasn't watching it on purpose. I'm just saying, say yes for the dress was on in the background, and I just it and it occurred to me, like, oh man, one day she might get married. And I was so floored that I wrote as a dad. I wrote. I used to write for the newspaper in our town, like I had a newspaper column, and I wrote uh, a letter to the young man who wants to marry my daughter, and I just poured paragraph after paragraph after paragraph out, and I just said. You better be legit. You better treat her right. Like, and I just poured it out there. I haven't even met the guy yet. She's like not even a week old here. And I'm writing letters to her about her future. Now, I'm just a flawed human dad. So how much more does your God love you? When he created what he created, when he put stuff into creation, why, why was it on day six that he made Adam and Eve? Why, why didn't he just make them on day one? Well, I think he wanted to get the nursery ready. He wanted to buy stuff that was special. He wanted to put stuff around that, were, that was colorful. He wanted to put like mechanisms, like diaper genies, to get rid of the smell and like make things safe. And I don't know. It's just like I look at this and I go, absolutely. Creation is part of our nursery heritage that God joyfully prepared for us long before we shored our faces. So picture him smiling as he thinks about you while he's inventing the clouds. We were just outside, and somebody said, can I go to the shade because it's really hot out? Like, just imagine, imagine God saying, I'm going to make clouds so that one day you can have shade. You can have rain. You can see a rainbow. Can you just imagine God not just creating clouds because he's God and he's sovereign and he's creating mechanisms of natural law, but because he's like, oh, this will be really cool. I'm super excited about this. Imagine him purposely placing every star in the sky so that you would know, as the Psalms say, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love toward you. Not just me, but you. I'm going to put an extra one right there because in, in October of 2022, they're going, to be, they're going to be outside one night and they're going to look up at the stars and they're going to see this one they've never seen before. And, and they're going to go, wow. And they're going to remember that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is my love. Heritage. So we have Trinity and then we have heritage. God made us on purpose, with purpose, as part of his family, and he passed down good blessings to us. And what this means is if we have a Trinity who gives us a heritage, like anything that's a heritage, maybe you've inherited things, we can claim the greater values and identify what has been passed down to us from someone who loves us. Does anybody own something from like a grandpa or an uncle, like a, like a pocket knife or anything that like was passed down to you? Yeah, what, what is it? Pocket knife. Pocket knife, okay. What do you got? Um, it's a fishing knife. Cool. Awesome. What's yours? Jewelry. What is it? Jewelry. Jewelry. Gotcha. Oh, that's awesome. Jacket. Yes. Pair, pair of socks? Oh, fun. Okay, yeah. Toolbox. Toolbox. All right, anybody else? What's been passed down to you? Yeah. Tackle box. Tackle box. Fun. Yep. What was it? A rifle. A rifle. Awesome. Yeah, so when you have those things, 
and you go to grab those things, you could just grab it and go, it's my rifle, it's my tackle box, or you can stop and go, this was given to me. And usually like when you show people, you're like, this is, this is my, my grandpa's whatever, lighter, you know, knife. Like, why are you carrying a lighter around? Because it's my grandpa's, that's why. You know, so you, who knows? But like whatever that is, and then you think of that person, and then you think about how much that person loves you or who that person was. You're probably not going to carry around like something that belonged to a family member who hated you or a family member who was like had bad character. I don't know, maybe you would. Maybe there'd be a, a biblical reason for it, like a love your enemies kind of thing. But my thought is, is you probably have these things in your life because they remind you of the person that you connected with. What if God had an absolute blast making creation as our heritage? So imagine God saying, I'm thinking this breed of dog will look like a small nervous sausage. Yeah, that could be, that could be. But like, but like he put the potential for what this dog would be into the first dogs that he made. Like, like God didn't just see what he made, he saw what that was going to become over time. So I'm thinking the flipper isn't big on this creature, it just needs a cool waddle. Yes, like this, this thing, this will be awesome. Or this one gets a long and stretchy neck and this other one just looks long and stretchy. Like as God was, like, can you just imagine him enjoying this? Like you guys down there playing Calvin ball. You could be like, I uh, guess everybody hop on one foot. Or like, yeah, everybody, like you got, you're going to get hit with this boogie board. Like just, is God excited when he creates? Is God excited when he makes things? What do you get giddy creating? Anybody? What do you get excited creating? Music. Music. Cool. What else? Video games. Yes. Creative mode. What was that? Yes. Yeah. Painting. Maybe you like to cook? Yes. Cooking? Yeah. It's one of my favorite things. What else? Fashion. Fashion. Ah, like on paper, like you design or do you like make? Sewing. Yeah. Fun? Awesome. Yeah. Stories. Stories. Great. Any Lego builders in the house? I did yeah. that a lot. Did you? Yeah. It's hard to get rid of those. Like when you, when you spend all that time, you're like, I don't think I'm going to sell these. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's good. So if you get giddy creating and you're made in the image of God, then what does that tell us? Now, why do you get giddy creating? Something wrong with me if I don't get giddy creating. You okay. No, I mean, you don't. I mean, do you, I'm not saying like, <laughs> like a mad scientist. I'm saying like, this is fun. There's something that you do that comes out of you creatively that brings some sort of joy to you. Maybe giddy is a strong word, but. Dopamine. Dopamine, yeah. Did you? No? All right, you're just, yeah. Fun. It's a good question. Why do you get giddy creating? I think the answer, I don't know, but I think the answer is because God does. I think we're made in the image of God, and I think God didn't just, like, go, and let it be so, there shall be light, but, like, let's make some light. Like, I just think, I think that's what it is. I can't prove it. But as I look at this world, I got to believe he had some fun making it. Even in its fallen state, it reflects God. So we have a heritage. God made us on purpose, with purpose, as part of his family, as part of his family, and he passed down good blessings to us. You weren't just given creation. You were also given a creator whose image you're made in. We're going to wrap things up here. I want to make sure that you guys catch these, these takeaways. God made the universe and could live with intensity anywhere in it, but the place that he most wants to live in is you. The reason we spent all this time on Genesis, guys, is because this is the takeaway. Out of all the majesty of everything he's made, he most wants to live in you. He most wants to live in you. He wants to develop you. So when we say something like, recite Genesis... What we're really saying is recite your identity. Let's close with that. Anybody willing to recite your identity based on what we've read, based on what you've learned over the years from God? Not just, I want to stand up and be sassy about my identity, but like, recite your identity with authority. Anybody? I'm a child of God. Amen. Somebody else, recite your identity with authority.
good. And if God's at work in you, this light comes out through the flaws and the struggles, through all the cracks. And it's cool you get to figure that out for the rest of your life, you know? Chisel away at it. One more. Somebody with authority. Who are you? Who are you? Somebody with authority. I'm a son. That is a great word. It sums up a lot. Cool. Guys, it's, uh, that's our thought for that. This is the foundation for everything that follows. And I just want to say thank you for kind of rolling with it. We're going to do some more unorthodox learning together, which may or may not involve more Calvin Ball. It probably won't. Uh, but we have some other, some other things that I think will keep us engaged. Um, please, again, personalize all this. It's great that you're taking notes. I would encourage you that uh, document of questions that you created earlier. If you have some free time tonight, and you're just sitting around, and you're like, what are we going to talk about? Bust that out. It's going to create some great conversations that you'll, you'll have some great intellectual debate over, but then maybe after you'll go, so what does this mean for our identity? And this is, this is always a great question. This is a great landing point. I have uh, had friends over the years who spent a lot of time and effort uh, developing airtight cases for the science and the apologetics. And again, that's all good. But if it doesn't change you, it's education without transformation. You need to have transformation, and that's the point. Well, thank you all. Let me pray. Uh, Lord, thank you that we get to do this and journey with you. And thank you for letting me learn today from these amazing people that I'm still getting to know. Uh, And just that in itself is just evidence that you have put so much potential in this room to change the world, to change the world, Lord. I know that your disciples met in an upper room, and once they got hold of who you really were, uh, we're here today because of that. So may we get hold of who you are, and get hold of who we are because of you. And thank you for the genesis of all of that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.